What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Uh, This episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran, who Tom also knows. Rise25's mission is to connect business owners to their ideal peers, customers, and referral partners. Uh, We do this in three ways. One, we completely run and launch your own podcast, distribute across 11 different channels, dedicated blog posts, put it on social media. So you just show up and talk and we do everything else. Uh, Two, we do live in-person VIP days and receptions with top entrepreneurs all over the country. So check that out. And three, we do a done-for-you lead generation service where we manage a consistent outreach to your ideal clients and referral sources. This is not paid traffic, by the way. Uh, Since it requires a lot of humans to do the work, we have limited bandwidth, and we only want to work with the right company. So if it's interesting to you, go to rise25.com and contact us. I'm especially excited for today's guest. Uh, We email every day, multiple times a day. Today we have Tom Ross, and he is CEO and founder of Design Cuts. Uh, He's built an amazing company. He's built an audience of 400,000 designers and growing, grew the business to multiple seven figures and growing with more than 16 full-time staff. He's also one of the hosts of the Design, the Honest Designers Show, which if you search it, It is, and Tom, you may not know this, I don't know. Um, I did many searches for you, but it shows up. There's multiple lists of some of the top, most popular shows in the design community, and it's frequently in this one, two, or three slot if there's like top 10 design shows and all across the web on all these different lists. So check it out. And he's also the host of the Honest Entrepreneur Show where he gives a candid look as life as an entrepreneur. Tom, thanks for joining me. Thanks so much, Jeremy. Hell of an intro. Yeah. I think it's that's all, my favorite one I've heard. <laughs> all true. And you know what? We were talking a little bit before we got started and about the candid look as life as an entrepreneur. And it's funny because you say that. The first question I have for you is um, the dark side of entrepreneurship. You know, everyone talks about, you know, I've, you know, taking pictures in front of fancy houses, cars, and, you know, how much money they're making. And you and I know when you're running a company, there's a dark side of entrepreneurship. It's the real stuff that takes the time. And I want you to take me back. You're working a hundred hours a week. You end up in the hospital. Okay. Yeah. What was going on at that time? Okay. So I'm really into exposing this whole side of entrepreneurship. It sounds like you are too. Totally. I think you're exactly right. Historically, it's very much the watches and the Lamborghinis and there's still that side of it. I think things are evolving and I know around the time I started my company, this is like six years ago now, I discovered hustle culture and that whole side of things. I don't know if you've been in that space, I'm sure you're very aware of it, but I discovered some of the main... I live that space, Tom. What do you mean? (laughs) (laughs) It's true. You are one of the busiest guys I know, so (laughs) respect for that. Um, But yeah, around the time I was starting my company, I I really kind of got into it and discovered some of the main uh, ambassadors of that hustle culture, such as Gary Vaynerchuk, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty all or nothing as a character myself. So when I discovered this, it was like a magic pill. And correct me if I'm wrong, I, obviously hard work's been around forever, yeah. but I feel like the whole hustle culture has really taken off a lot more in like the last two, maybe three years. So six years ago, people weren't talking about it quite to the same extent. So I was looking around being like, no one else seems to really be on this thing yet. And I just went next level with my work. It was literally 18 hours a day, yeah. not 15, not 16, like 18 it was and if ludicrous. you're doing the math right like you have to go to the bathroom you have to eat you oh, know yeah. sleeping maybe is a side thing but it, <laughs> it doesn't leave a lot of room for the rest of the stuff yeah it really doesn't i would roll out of bed in the morning and sit on my bedroom floor i'd start working i'd have dinner i'd sit i'd live with my girlfriend and her family at this time and i would join them for five minutes of dinner wolf down some food and then be like sorry guys i have to keep working and I'd run upstairs. My girlfriend would go to bed at like 
10 p.m. or whatever, I'd go and kiss her goodnight, and then I'd go next door and I'd keep working until like three, four, sometimes even five in the morning. And I remember falling asleep on my keyboard, picking my head up and slapping my own, myself <laughs> in my own face and literally putting in Gary Vaynerchuk audio being like, hustle harder, you loser, like screaming at me. <laughs> And the whole the whole thing was freaking intense. Um, but the beauty of it was it really worked. And we saw traction pretty much immediately with, with my company. And that's great. But what ended up happening was it becomes addictive like a drug because you realize the harder you're working, the more you get back out. Right. And so it gets into this kind of death spiral where you just work harder and harder and harder. And obviously there's a ceiling with that. And obviously you can't maintain that long term. But I ignored virtually every red flag. I had my business mentors and partners being like, you probably need to slow down. You can't sustain this. I had people saying stuff like, you should only achieve one big thing ticked off on your list every day uh, in terms of one big project. And I was rejecting all of it. I was like, I was getting 20 big projects done a day. I, I thought I was unstoppable. And I, I talked about this recently on, on my show. I think it's similar to... Um, my dad, when he started his business, he's, he felt like you can take the world on because you mm. are literally running on adrenaline right. and it does feel like a drug. And so you're so blinkered in that. You don't see the bigger picture. You don't think about balance or your health or anything. It's like, I can do anything. I feel like Superman kind of thing. So what ended up happening was I started getting more and more burn out and the first time it just hit me like a, mm. a brick and i was like oh wow where did that come from i didn't see that coming how did and that started, manifest like when when like, you what I, did the I burnout first, look like to you it, it went like um comatose for like two three days like i just i was so wrecked like i couldn't get out of bed and it just came along very suddenly it kind of snuck up on me but then what happened was it started happening more often so mm -hmm. I'd feel like that every few months and then before I knew it every few weeks and then every few days and, bef and before I knew it I felt like that all the time and then as this started happening I started to get physically really sick and so this cough I had just got worse and worse and worse and then it got to the point I started vomiting and wow. uh, I don't want to get too graphic here on your podcast I hope you don't mind me sharing I've, the I've dissected details. cadavers so like you're not going to phase me yeah Okay, I need to ask you about that later. That's, <laughs> that's great too. Um, but yeah, what, what started happening was I would be vomiting for two hours every that's single scary. morning. Oh my gosh. Oh yeah, yeah. It was freaking me out. I was like, what the hell is happening to me? So I'd be vomiting two hours every morning. I'd get into work like late morning because I just felt so terrible up until about lunch. Um, and that was my life. And I'd be driving to work and like it just kept getting set off by nothing. So wow. I, I'd drive to work and I'd have to like stop my car in, in the middle of the road, Jeez. people honking at me and I'm like vomiting on the road. I had to pull into a corporate car park and I'm like vomiting there as people are getting into their office and they Where didn't did know me. Where did you think was like, happening? I, I really didn't know. So I was trying to see doctors and they weren't initially giving me answers, but it got so bad they had to investigate. And so what it turned out it was I had a, a hiatus hernia. Which yeah, is hey, you're, hernia, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's horrible like for if for the people listening who don't know what it is your stomach like slides up into your esophagus right. it makes you very sick and it's it's not very pleasant and um the doctor said like amongst some other things like an immensely stressful lifestyle had really exacerbated it and the symptoms around it and so i had to end up having major stomach surgery mm. um where they like yank your stomach back out and wrap it around itself and stitch it all up and with that began like the two hardest years of my life so it was like immense physical and mental struggle um suddenly the superman complex went to feeling like an 80 year old man i could like barely stand up and this went on for months and months and months mm. and well literally two years like i'd eat and i'd be in agony um it was incredibly rough and the whole time being an entrepreneur i couldn't just get bed rest i couldn't take a sabbatical right. what do you do I, well, like a week later, I'm out of hospital and and running my company again. But I'm doing it, and I've dropped um, two stone in weight, and I'm you know shaking and white and just a complete wreck. But I I had to keep doing it, and I'd regularly be having meetings. Like my bank manager came in and like physically recoiled because I looked like something out of The Walking Dead. He's like, "Whoa, what happened to you, man?" And that's yeah, not a good sign. <laughs> <laughs> 
but yeah, it's been it's been literally like a two two and a half year recovery at this point. Mm. And um, yeah, Jesus, I won't say it was smooth. I won't say I handled the whole thing perfectly. But boy, does that build some fortitude when you have to kind of pull yourself out of that because you feel like you've got no choice. Yeah. I mean, so you come back and you have to do things differently. So how do you manage or? you know, hire people or what do you do now that you can't be working 18 hours a day? Because sometimes it's a blessing in disguise where it's like, okay, you have to put some systems and people in place. Otherwise they weren't there because you can't do it all. So how did that work once you started putting things in place after? Yeah. So that was the blessing in disguise. And I truly believe like the hardest things generally speaking in life lead to some of the best results or the best learning lessons i know that sounds cliche but i've no, certainly totally. found it to be true and it, yeah it was simply that it forced me to start hiring more and to delegate more and before i was such a control freak with it i uh, i guess i had way too much ego in that respect um in thinking well no one can do it as well as me i'm not going to give any of this up micromanaging too much and now it's in a much stronger position where we've got a, a much bigger more established team people have great autonomy i'm, I'm happy to let go much much more and have a, a better work-life balance which i don't always get perfect but i mean damn it's better than 100 hour weeks i'll tell you that <laughs> yeah so what's what uh was a key hire or key system you put in place when you came back that maybe right now anyone listening should put in place before they end up in the hospital <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't know so much about systems. I mean, I, I, I'm happy to break down our hiring yeah. process because that's been effective. But rather yeah. than systems, I think just consider doing it earlier. For me, we hired way too late. We mm. didn't hire for 10 months into the company. And a lot of what I would kind of preach to uh, my business partners would be stuff about reinvesting into growth and hiring. But the actions weren't aligning with that quickly enough. And it was pretty dumb. Um, like, forget health or any of that stuff. I believe we we could have scaled much more effectively by hiring strategically. But all of that is, I'd only managed remote teams before this. So mm -hmm. it's been learning on the job. You know, if I went now with my experience and knowledge back to year one, I would invariably do a lot of things differently. But that's just the nature of learning, right? Yeah. What was a key hire? What was a key like, position that you um, wish you would have done earlier? There were a few of them. I, I would say one of them was me uh, researching the products that we feature because we sell a lot of design resources and products. Yeah. But that would then involve me going through you know tens of thousands of different places to source these things. It was very, very laborious. And, and that was a job that it felt like it was impossible to hire for because yeah. it was such a random mix of experience where it's like I'd had design experience, but also marketing experience in all these different areas. And it felt very difficult to hire for. But now we've got someone who's fantastic at that and at least as good as me. Well, it's also something you take pride in. So if anyone checks out Design Cuts, I mean, you one of the big differentiators is just it's phenomenal design right and and uh appreciate it man Thank if you. you take that away then what's a differentiator what, what are people coming for so i could see how that's kind of uh something that you wanted to keep as long as humanly possible not saying it's the right decision yeah. it's just i could see how you would want to do that yeah i mean if I, you guys are very good from um, my understanding and what i can see in terms of systems and processes and you're actually helping to teach me through osmosis, I think, how to do that better in my own business. But my natural tendencies, what I'm great at, yeah. are not very scalable. I'll put my hands up and admit that I'm having to now learn more and more of that stuff. I'm very good at the unscalable, and part of that is quality over quantity. Mm -hmm. So I prefer to go much deeper in every respect, whether that's deeper in terms of product quality, deeper in terms of customer care and interaction. All of it's very hands-on, very unscalable, but I believe in that side of things. So, Tom, do you get this push forward, hustle, do whatever it takes from your dad? What was his business that he, he started? Uh, his business is totally different, actually. He's mm. sold everything from, like, laptops to photocopiers and printers and stuff like that over the years. But they've been going about 30 years. Actually, mm -hmm. even longer than that now, I think. But, yeah, pretty crazy. Was that, like, did you get uh, certain lessons from him on, on these topics or? 
I, I actually didn't. I have had certain lessons from him, but a lot of it has just been me immersed in a bubble of self-learning online because, to be honest, it's wildly different from how he's much more traditional in business. Um, he doesn't fully understand everything I do. It's very, yeah, it's a different realm, right? The whole online marketing and e-commerce and all of that side of things. Yeah. So a lot of it's been self-taught. And something I tend to preach to people is be mindful of who you're consuming right you you have listeners consuming you and i presume knowing you that you know they're getting great value from that but the same way that teenage girls read glossy magazines and end up with body issues mm. the same thing can happen with anyone including entrepreneurs and when what you're hearing is inherently damaging or blinkered or, or one-sided and and lacks balance that has a huge impact and I'm staggered. I, I've been encouraging friends and, and um, peers online to do this, and I did it myself. When you audit the circle of who you're following and suddenly your whole feed of daily content changes, it changes your mindset. And, mm-hmm. and I found I, I had to do that. I can now listen to some of the, the rah-rah motivation stuff within a wider recipe of content I consume. But for totally. a long time, if I literally had a Gary Vaynerchuk video on, I would start to feel physically sick because it would start triggering anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, but for the record, this is not me razzing on him. Like, no, of I've, course. I've, I've, I've got every book he's released. I, I'm just I think thinking, like, of- I'm going to clip that one part out and put it on social media. I was listening to <laughs> Gary Vaynerchuk and it got physically sick. And just leave out the rest of the disclaimer on there. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, please give it context, Jeremy. Yeah. Don't do me like that. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, there's like, a time honestly, and a place it, for that. You know what I mean? There is a time and a place for it. And I mean, I, again, I ask because I err more towards what, what you do, like how you were, right? That's just my nature, right? So I totally relate to that and I actually enjoy it and thrive on it. And it's probably not a yeah. good thing, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's a little, it's kind of type eight, right? Yeah, totally. And and that could be really powerful and really fun. Um, but I am, I'm trying to stir up a bit of a wider debate about this stuff. My way of thinking is that I think the people get who get heard the most tend to preach the most extreme views. So there's two aspects there. One is that you're probably hearing something that's their most extreme side and you're hearing it hyperbolized in social media and then amplified by everyone else. So suddenly ironically it's become cool right to be unglamorous back in the day it was all lamborghinis now you've got everyone being like i'm freaking homeless and i'm working 28 hours a day and like you know (laughs) essentially self-harming with my my work-life balance and and that's super cool and that means i'm a thoroughbred real entrepreneur i think it's almost gone down that path and that's even more dangerous than the douchebags with the lamborghinis in my opinion um yeah it's just yeah, it's not it's not great. And I think what you really need to do, you need to come up with that recipe where it's like, okay, I'll take a, a pinch of motivation from there and a little bit of hustle from there when I need it and a little bit of mindfulness there and some chill from there and have a bit of a laugh over there. But when all you're consuming is like hustle, 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 it makes you pretty one-dimensional and pretty mm-hmm. unhappy, I think. Yeah. Um, so there's two cornerstones that you talk about and that you live with your company. I want to kind of dive into those a little bit. Um, building disruptive brand and building highly engaged communities. Okay. Let's start with the highly engaged community. Cause anyone, I was listening to someone who was interviewing you and they said, how did you get so much traction on, you know, the honest designers podcast? And I'm like thinking they had built a, highly engaged with design cuts a highly engaged audience so you have a built-in audience that you've built and you release something to them and you get tons of traction right but it took you a long time to do that talk about how you build because you started from ground zero with design Mm -hmm. cuts how do you build a highly engaged community what do you tell people i tell people two things that referral is one of the best ways you can grow an audience and a lot a lot of the stuff which I practice, it takes like creative application and it takes hard work and it can take smarts and talent and all those things. But when it really comes down to the cornerstones of it, it's basic stuff. So I knew the stats told me that referral, i.e. word of mouth, was it, that would generate the highest quality of person. Totally. Right. Compared to like, you know, social media, um, advertising or organic search even. 
or direct or email or anything, like it generally came down to a referral. So it's like, okay, what are two ways of doing that? So there's affiliates and, and people of that nature. And then there's quite literally word of mouth of customers. So it's like, great. Well, if you want to attract the highest quality of person, you focus on those two things. So you build up a network of peers that like what you're doing and are happy to promote it. That covers affiliates. And then word of mouth, you hustle, sorry to use that word, (laughs) you hustle your face off to wow your customers. You build real relationships with them and you go really, really, really deep with your interactions Mm -hmm. with them. And I'm happy to share that. I don't feel like, oh no, suddenly our secrets are revealed. It's like, that stuff sounds pretty obvious. Knowing it is not the hard bit. The hard bit is the working 100 hours a day because you're chatting with Debbie in Arkansas about her cats at four in the morning because you care enough not to leave her hanging or ignore her email and actually to become her friend and doing that at scale. What are some wow moments? Like you just mentioned, Debbie, what's another time and how you wowed the customer endless like we we do it all the time um sending them personalized gifts um we just like we do cool competitions and stuff like that but not in a um not in a lead generation way so all right here's an idea for people people are all i think people are all about what am i going to do to get more people to sign up like sign up and you might win this iPad or sign up to get this free stuff that's behind the red curtain or in the mystery box. What about doing stuff for the people you already have? And I think that is a fundamental shift that's changed my career. I think, I think it's so powerful. It's the same. It's the equivalent of like phone companies, right? They entice you in and you're like, this is great. And then before you know it, they're hiking the prices up and they ignore you because they've moved on to the next thousand customers they're trying to entice in. So true. Yeah. And that makes you feel like shit. So if you want to build a community, stop focusing on the next thousand people and worry about the thousand or the hundred or the ten that you already have. And again, easy to say, hard to do. As humans, like even now when I'm, I'm building a bit of a, a new community around my personal brand and that kind of stuff, I get suckered into it and I'll find my actions won't align with what I just told you. So I, I'll be kind of chatting to the people over here or trying to get on the podcast over there and then I'm like, oh man, I haven't really given enough attention to the 10, 20, 50 people that really give a shit about me. I need to be doing more for them. And we always, our, our nature blocks us, right? Yeah. Like, well, that's not going to scale. And like, you know, I, I should be on the podcast over there. I should be focused on that. And it's like, it's so damaging to ignore those people because they're everything. They're the foundation. Yeah. Yeah, it's so true. It's, it's We immediately go to what's new, which is usually the hardest to execute on. And the easiest to execute on is there's like 50 people now that would have you on in like a snap because they know you, they love you, they trust you, and we just forget about it. It's not like you even ignore it. It's like you just, oh, that that's too easy. I don't want to do that, you know? So I <laughs> it, totally it, get it's it. Really count, yeah, really counterintuitive, and, and you kind of touched on it there, but it makes business sense in that if you're really wanting to boil people down to just numbers and figures, which I don't recommend doing, then it is cheaper as well. It's much cheaper to remarket to existing people than it is to pay for new leads. It's way cheaper. So like on paper, it makes sense. And it makes sense in terms of morality and being a decent person and treating people right. Yeah. So building a disruptive brand. Talk about that with Design Cuts. Sure. So for the record, I think, um, what's the majority of your listeners, Jeremy? Is it fellow entrepreneurs like us? Yeah, I would okay. say so, yeah. Cool. So I feel very privileged that pretty much from when I started messing around with this stuff at 12 years old, I've been in the design space and the entrepreneurship space in tandem. And that has been one of my greatest assets because I think 99.9% of entrepreneurs suck shit at branding and design. It's embarrassing. They're all sales all the time it's funnels and it's pushing stuff out and their website often looks hideous they haven't really built a compelling brand they're not presenting themselves in the right way and there's dudes doing this like the youtube pre-roll guys not that there's anything wrong with pre-roll but a lot of them are like the lamborghini guy and you think they must like the amount they're pumping into ads they must be turning over millions and if what they're saying in the ad is true they must be turning over multi multi millions and their website looks like it was done by a five-year-old 
It looks like it was <laughs> 1990. If it was you when you were five, it would have looked good, but... <laughs> maybe not five maybe 12 yeah. lego or something yeah yeah <laughs> but um yeah like i i think let me give you an example i'm guessing you're familiar with marie folio yes i think she can massively stand out in the entrepreneurial space because she has a really really nice brand and it, it branded of course isn't just about design it's about everything coming together i tend to define brand as how other people talk about you when you're not there what's like the nutshell description that they give you oh that's jeremy and he does xyz kind of thing you know right. what springs to mind for them so branding is is design but it's also um you know you as a person it's the values you stand for it's what differentiates you it's your usbs and i think branding is it's like art it's like an orchestra, right? When everything comes together seamlessly, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And when it becomes consistent and it, it weaves through everything, that's freaking awesome. That excites me. Where the copywriting in the email matches the LinkedIn and the Facebook header text, which matches the graphics on the website. And it's all congruent. Fun, like, yeah, it's all congruent. It all flows beautifully. Um, I think that's incredibly powerful. I think Maria, as I mentioned, is a great example of that. And can you imagine if she had like the super long form sales page with the flashing red text, which looks like it's done on GX cities, she wouldn't have the community and the brand and, and the credibility that she has, but she does a really great job with that stuff. And I think, um, I think that's a massive, um, white space for many entrepreneurs. If you're making any kind of money, like how about you scale back the ads for a week or two and actually get a decent web designer involved, a decent brand designer if you can't do it yourself. Yeah. Yeah. So some of the big mistakes people make with building their disruptive brand is they're just not paying it. They're paying attention maybe to one aspect, but not all of them. Mm -hmm. Seems. Yeah. Yeah, it's not tying together. Um, this is an old mentor of mine he used to use this expression, but it becomes Frankenstein, where you're kind of bolting various bits on. Yeah. And I love that description. I still use it all these years later f from when I first heard it. And we're guilty of this ourselves. I think everyone is because you tweak things and you add things and that compounds. So over time, five years later, three years later, whatever, suddenly nothing really goes together. Yeah. And it's all just a bit of a mess. And then what you need to do is have a mass audit of everything and like a, a yeah. spring clean. Sometimes Unless it's good, yeah, just do a complete revamp. Yeah, and that's what most people do. But I think that can be expensive. It can be damaging. Mm -hmm. um, and it means you're slowly eroding and degrading to the point of doing that. So what we're trying to push more now is like an iterative approach, right? Where every month is small tweaks the same way you, you well, more, <laughs> more in the past maybe. But I remember I used to go on Facebook and I felt like every week it, there were subtle tweaks, which most users wouldn't notice. But as a, a web designer, I'd be like, ah, oh, they've tweaked that, they've changed that. So no one notices anything changing. But a year later, you're on a different website totally right. than what you used to be on. Totally. I want to dig a little deeper into who should be using design cuts and for what. But I want to talk about, because you mentioned this early on, you were doing a lot of the kind of curation. Um, how do you choose what's featured on design text? With an incredibly high bar of quality. Yeah. Like, it is ridiculous. We often get stuff, and, and we get it from all kinds of places. We're actually getting more and more um, suppliers approaching us, and a lot of the time our community are like, oh, you need to work with these guys. They're really great. So we get a lot of stuff kind yeah. of incoming. Talk about how that and, works a little bit, the background. So people can go yeah. on the site and get. Um, yeah, so people go on the site and it basically sells the products, tools and resources that designers use on a daily basis. So it could be fonts, it could be social media templates to make a social media look nicer. It could be illustrations if you're making greetings cards and selling them on Etsy, just all manner of stuff. And we try and differentiate and i think do so successfully because we're curated quality so instead of there being an ocean of noise and crappy products and there's a few gems in there we only sell the gems and so it's a smaller product base but you know everything's been hand tested and curated in this way and so it's a much nicer experience yeah how do you choose what's featured because <clears throat> now it's not so, just you you have mm -hmm. probably have a team deciding and there's probably a process yeah. 
of they have yeah, to get through and probably there's a yeah, lot of people applying a, to get through this yeah like design is quite arbitrary and subjective isn't it so we can't have a checklist exactly but um i think what everyone else does they either don't screen it or they kind of just cast an eye and, and chuck it up anyway um what we do is <laughs> i told you i'm good at unscalable stuff we're, we're actually going to do a public video showing how unscalable it is because I, I don't think people realize what how much we put into it right but our team will like ruthlessly go through and reject stuff they don't deem good enough and that's just subjectively them casting a trained desire eye on it but then we get the products and then we download them and we test them out to make sure they're working and a lot of the time we identify issues and it might be being sold on other websites and no one noticed this but we get the issues and we fix them and we go through and even if it's kind of okay we tidy them up and make all the files better organized so the end user and customer has a way better experience so the whole thing is making it like a great product an exceptional product in some cases is making it the best it can be and it's doing that manually so unscalable as hell but boy it's a better experience for the user who uses design cuts and who should be using design cuts? Because I went on and um, just to you browse around and I could see a lot of applications for just a normal entrepreneur. And it seems like probably a lot of designers use it. But like just if you do any webinars or PowerPoints, it seems like there's so many resources just for that alone. Who's mm-hmm. using it, I guess? And then what should they be using it for? What should they go on design cuts for? <laughs> So it's really grown because we have so many customers now all over the world. It's varied. We get, do you know what digital scrapbooking is? Because I didn't before my company. I've only heard of, I don't know exactly <laughs> what it is, but I know there's conferences of, of people okay. who've done these type of things. So it's like, it must be big if there's a whole yeah. conference on it. I love it. It's one of my favorite niches. So yeah. it's, it's like the old school. You get a, a scrapbook thing and you put in pictures of your, your kids and your grandkids. It's like that, but digitally. So you're dropping in all these different graphics and objects and building like a digital collage and mm. normally it's family mm. stuff. That's particularly popular with like middle-aged to older ladies for the most part. Right. And like they go nuts and they love that stuff and they create some really cool looking designs. That's one pocket of it. We also have like big companies buying from us. We also have brand agencies, solopreneurs, like hobbyists, people making stuff to sell on Etsy and physical product designers, a whole spectrum. But you touched on entrepreneurs. Yeah. Like, for example, with your audience, social media templates, PowerPoint and keynote slides, like all this stuff is meant to be beautiful out of the box. And so um for me you know i see this stuff every every day so i'm like yeah like it's cool i know for a lot of people seeing it the first time they're like hold on you mean this is going to save me three weeks of like faffing around because it works and outside the- not only that but it actually looks good like oh, like yeah. at the end of three weeks i'm going to produce something that looks like crap <laughs> and and it's not going to be beautiful so <laughs> it's like a waste not only three weeks but it's not even for me it's not even going to come out that good you know and and it shouldn't because you're not a designer. Yeah. Like if I tried to do much of what you do, I would suck at it. That's just the nature of it. But it's when it's ridiculous value as well. And I, I don't want to kind of pitch this too hard. I'm just being transparent about it. But like from a, a business sense, yeah. Um, I think I think the best business models are where everyone wins. And so for us, it's like well, our suppliers they produce these amazing products. They don't always know how to sell them. We like selling them, so we help the supplier. And then our customers get a great deal and they buy it. And I've drawn this little triangle out for my team so many times. I'm like, this is great because no part of this triangle loses. Everyone right. wins. What's the most popular items featured? I know when I was looking, my favorite was there's some 1,400 infographics mm-hmm. design <laughs> thing that is like, wow. You know, I'm like, John, we should... Uh, for our, actually make our webinars look really professional with this. <laughs> but, uh, what are the most popular ones on the site? Um, that one is very popular. Yeah. The one that you just cited. Um, fonts tend to be pretty popular as well, always. Um, a lot of graphics. We just teamed up with one of the world's foremost illustrators and <laughs> released possibly the cutest pack 
of all time where it's all like cute animals that she's hand drawn and you can build like a yeah. magical world out of them that's currently going nuts with people mm. and th- they're making all this stuff they sell on etsy like pillowcases and and cards really? and things like that and that's freaking awesome to see yeah i'm just looking over here because i'm looking at the featured products so if, if you if you go on the magical scene creator that's the one uh, I'm talking about, and we, yeah, we just oh, yeah, had I see our, that right here. Yeah, it was so fun. Like we had a launch where I've been wanting to do webinars for years. We did our first webinar, and 700 people jumped on. I think I emailed you about this. Yeah, blew my mind. Like I couldn't keep up with the comments. It's amazing. And um, we need to do more of these. So the magical scene creator, the infographic. What else is popular? Uh, like I say, some well, the feature products you're kind of seeing some of the most popular right now. Okay, so a few there's graphics. There's a grid like builder. It, there's a that that's super popular. That's by my buddy uh, Ian Barnard. He's my co-host on the podcast we do as well. Um, so that's another niche, you know. That's for hand letterers. That's for mm-hmm. people doing calligraphy and doing cool letter work. Yeah. He provided all these grids so they can actually lay out their their lettering properly, and it's yeah. not a mess. I would suggest anyone go to Design Cuts, um, even if you're not going to buy something, um, but just to get your creative juices flowing. Like I found when I was looking at the site, I was just thinking of other opportunities or other things that were not even related to the specific design. Well, I'll I'll give you an example of that, Jeremy. So um, we're trying to build a community, right? You might notice I'm more about brand and community than sales. I feel like the sales is secondary. It kind of just comes when you get that other stuff right. So we've got a community forum now. Myself and my creative director, Matt, we're launching a new show and we're saying to people on the forum, suggest your designs, your websites, whatever. And we're going to do an in-depth constructive critique as part of a new video series for free. Like I've charged five hundred dollars for these before, and we just like doing cool stuff like that for the community because it's a value adder. Like how if it, if you guys want to put your website on there, like we'll break it down and be like, here's every single way that you could improve it. Like you'd have a heyday. <laughs> 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 um, what's the usage allowed? So you said people can take them and they've been doing stuff on Etsy. Like, do they get like a full? license they can use it however they want or is there just limited usage of it how does it work so most places tend to charge more for commercial licenses um often it's like 10 times the regular price yeah um but that's one of the the key usps that we managed to nail down uh was that's all wrapped in for the same price that's amazing so that's that's something people tend to love quite a lot actually like the only caps are um like there, there's obviously license restrictions. You can't just like download someone else's product and sell it on as your own or something. Um, it's got to yeah, be it's, like a different in a different like on something or you some have to, other you product. Have to make something out of it. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's the best license available anywhere. And actually, to drop in a, a tip about that, something I did back in the day, I thought it was a viable business model. Right. I, I looked at certain websites and I thought, well, they're making a million a year. So if I do 10% as good a job as them, I'm going to make 100K a year. And I was an idiot. I was like a foolish kid because, of course, who's going to pay for the thing that's one-tenth as good as the main thing? Who's going to pay for the best thing? Um, so there's no way you're going to make 100K. You're probably not even going to make 1K a year doing that. So I know with Design Cuts, one of my things was I systematically worked out how to be the best in our industry. I was like, I have no interest in being second best in any area. So it's like, we've got to have the best products. We've got to have the best license. We've got to have the best customer service. And people might listen to that and think, well, there's no way I can do that in my industry. And it's like, well, that's why niches exist. Mm-hmm. So you, you can niche down. But I truly believe it's like, if you're third best, not only shouldn't people use you, but when you're trying to market telling them they should use you, you won't be able to do so with real confidence. Because in the back of your mind, you're like, well, I know they're going to get a bum deal compared to if they went with Sally up the road. Yeah. What's been some popular use cases for the designs? Like you mentioned people selling on Etsy or have people like create a t-shirt company out of something on this. What have been some of the favorite like entrepreneurial stories that have come out of design cuts? Oh, I'm, I'm trying to think what I'm legally allowed to share. Okay. So, um, <laughs> I, I won't name the company name, but I would say a very, very big publishing house 
um, basically kitted out their massive design team. I think it was like 400 designers or something um, with some of our products. So many of the mm. biggest uh, book covers in the world mm. have been done using our resources. And I see it all the time, man. Like I'll be out for dinner with my girlfriend. Probably at least 50% of the time, the font on the menu is one that we've sold. Mm. Like it is that's so prevalent. Cool. Like it's so nerdy, right? No one but designers appreciates that stuff. Yeah. But you see it everywhere. And when you, like some of these, we we created products in house. When you see a product that you've worked on in a shop window, and you're like, that's damn, cool. that's crazy. The yeah. fact that you would even notice it out of all the designs you guys produce is actually pretty pretty remarkable. I, I, after five years, you wouldn't believe the depths to my geekiness. Yeah. Like I will see like a letter in a shop window in New York, and I'll be like. I instantly know the supplier's first name and the name of their kids looking at it. It's just That's like amazing. It's soaked into my head now. <laughs> yeah, so I guess anyone who publishes book covers or illustrators or anyone in the design community, I guess, is a fit for this. They can use it, but companies who do that as, you know, what they do is, is always good for that as well. Um, what's, you know, you talk about this on the podcast, um, you know, the Honest Designers podcast. There's the good and the bad about being a designer in general, right? Yeah. What's the bad? I mean, I could see the uh, good. You're working from home probably. You can make your own schedule. What's, mm-hmm. what's some things say is, is the hard, hard stuff? There's a ton. And designers, I think they're some of the most wonderful people. The design community at large is awesome. But, man, if you start posting memes like sharing client headaches – that stuff takes off like there's a lot of crap that designers um have to deal with and we talk about a lot of that on the honest designer show podcast um for example we recently did a halloween episode sharing our design horror stories and i was doing this ridiculous voice for half of it being like spooky and (laughs) it was just (laughs) super stupid but um yeah you're you're kind of like the bottom feeders it feels like at times Hmm. I, I, Why? I worked as a designer, by the way, for the record, for yeah. like 10 years before I started doing you know, more company stuff. And you will get clients micromanaging, breathing down your neck. You feel like a performing monkey where it's like they just tell you every pixel of what they want and they're practically just telling you where to move the mouse, but they can't use Photoshop themselves. Um, so there's a lot of stuff like that. I think like any creative and i would map this to many entrepreneurs as well it comes with huge amounts of anxiety imposter syndrome things like that because you've got the double whammy of like i don't know if my skills are good enough and my work's good enough mm. but also i'm many of them are trying to do this to make a living they might be freelance designers so it's like i also don't know if i'm good enough and if i'm going to make it and support my family or, or pay my mortgage so mm. um a lot of pressure I, yeah, and it, it's, um, I believe the same is very much true for entrepreneurs, but there are many similarities with entrepreneurs and designers. Mental health tends to statistically be higher, for example, um, which is completely understandable. Uh, and I think it's a combination of the job uh, invoking that, but also the natural disposition. Uh, designers, for example, a lot of your ego gets tied into your work. So if a client doesn't like what you do, then it really, really hits hard. Take it personally. Yeah, exactly. So there's a ton of stuff really that's negative. But on the upside, when you really get down to it, it's like you're like the kid at school who sits and draws. Like you get paid to do that, and that's the coolest thing in the world. So when you strip away all the bullshit around it, like it's a pretty cool job. Yeah. Um, what works to spread the word about what you guys do? You know, I noticed when I go to these, it says pin it. Is Pinterest, do people spread this stuff on Pinterest a lot? Yeah, they do. Pinterest is really visual. I think if um, if you're not in the d- design world, you might not use it that much unless like you're renovating your home or getting married or saving recipes or something of that nature. It seems to be for kind of pockets of certain industries and interests, but it's definitely big in the design world. There's some kind of power players on there. Uh, who tend to enjoy sharing our stuff as well as a, a lot of the wider community at large. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I was talking to, it, it just shocked me. I was talking to Jason Miles of Pixie Fair. I, I said, you guys need to talk. And he, when I was talking to him, he said, 
you know, there's like six sites that get the most traffic or referral traffic or whatever he was saying. And he's like listed Pinterest. And I'm like, wow, that is like a huge, you know, no one's talking about that. No one's talking about yeah. Pinterest. Yeah, because it's it's more niche. I'm not sure it's going to work for everyone. Yeah, and there's more niche than that. I mean, you got like Dribble, Behance, some of these designer specific social networks as well. So mm-hmm. it depends how niche you want to go. Yeah, um, Tom, I always ask because Inspired Insider one, what's been a low moment, how you push through it, and obviously we talked a little bit about uh, one of those, and then two, what's been a proud moment, um, you know, that you're you come out the other side. Um, you know, from the, the low moment, it sounds like it was that time, obviously, when you were super sick and yeah, and I, I touched a little bit on mental health with that. Being candid with you, at one point, I thought I was never going to get better, mm. so I thought I was going to live like an eighty-year-old man for the rest of my life, and I'm like in my late twenties at this point, so I'd be in my kitchen at work making tea and bursting into tears at the sheer frustration of holy shit i've ruined my life so yeah that's you thought that's it was going to be permanent yeah seriously because it just wasn't getting better so that's definitely a low moment why do you think that because the were they just not diagnosing it properly <laughs> um because i kept going back to the doctor and he was saying it will get better it will get better and i'm like but it's not i'm still mm. super sick and they couldn't really do anything more was this after the surgery or before yeah, yeah. This would be like it was a year after. after the sur- yeah, yeah. Like six months, twelve months after wow. the surgery, I'm still, I'm still like a wreck. Jeez. So yeah. you're like, you lost, you started to lose hope. Yeah. Big time. Thank God it got better. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I try and hold. Like, as humans, we're really, really good at letting go of gratitude, and it's really annoying. Because I remember when I first started feeling like my old self, I was like skipping down the street, rainbows and unicorns, being like this is the greatest. I'll never take my health for granted ever again. And then a few months later, you're like, man, I'm kind of hung over today. And like, man, I can't be bothered to go to the gym. And you're just a normal person again. Right. But I was elated mm. for a long while with the smallest thing. I'd be like, I wake up and my stomach doesn't hurt. I can, right. I can swallow this food and, and it's not uncomfortable. Like the smallest day to day stuff I loved. Mm. So what do you do now? Cause you realize that at some point, right? Like, oh, I can go to the gym. Well, I can go to the gym. Like, maybe, <laughs> yeah. like six months ago, you couldn't. So, what do you do to remind yourself of those, or, or just just come to you automatically when you find yourself, you know, just taking for granted your normal health? I think I'm just overall happier and more content. But again, being very truthful with you, that's one of the biggest things I'm trying to work on right now mm. is actually just having more fun. I was watching a bunch of YouTube videos about this last night and the guy was really on point talking about it and I think we can get so lost. I think it's typical of many type A entrepreneurs where it's like, how can I self-improve relentlessly? How can I scale my business and iterate that and iterate that and iterate that? And you start applying the same thing to yourself. How can I compartmentalize all these different parts of my life and self-improvement becomes an addiction? And before you know it, it's like, man like i need to just chill and like have <laughs> like have more of a laugh with my friends or like right. just you know like take the foot totally. off the gas a little bit so so that's a big thing i'm trying to do in general like irrespective of the health issues is mm. just like take a step back and chill sometimes mm. and just enjoy what do you do for fun to relax? i it sounds super boring like obviously i love seeing my friends hanging out with them they're great um i play guitar and bass used to be in a band now Mm. i just kind of do it recreationally um i like creative stuff so i dabble a little bit with like short film making and stuff like that when i have the time um what was the band uh, called (laughs) so i look uh, it up and clip it in there (laughs) oh no (laughs) I'll only tell you if you promise not to do that. Uh, <laughs> no, I we can't haven't, even really, we haven't so. really got anything out there. Even it was more like we do, we gig locally, and um, yeah, even better. Quite quite the fan base in the local pubs. <laughs> so um, on the flip side, Tom. So obviously, there's been some some low moments, a dark side of entrepreneurship. You know, hustling, working hundred hour weeks. <clears throat> What's been especially proud for you? It's been a bunch of stuff. I think um, genuinely when you have a team, you in a weird way feel like a parent at points. And 
often the proud moments come with our annual Christmas party mm. where a few of the directors band together and the team are just out there oblivious to you and they're all getting drunk and laughing and they've befriended each other. Mm. And you look out and go, holy shit, we did this from nothing. That's normally a little kind of tipsy moment of pride. But there's been tons of moments along the way yeah. with the team and individually. I know in year one, um, especially when we st- <laughs> we were working in the corner of a bigger corporate's office. We didn't have our own office space. We didn't need it at that point. And me and my business partner, we were making our first sales. And we're in the sales floor where everyone's kind of serious. And we're like sprinting up and down it, like jumping up and down and high-fiving each other because we're so elated that we just sold like $20 worth of stuff. <laughs> So, um, yeah, that, that kind of stuff was fun. Um, and we've done all kinds of stuff. Like we've, we've, with our suppliers, the people where we sell their products, we've paid for people's kids to go to college. Mm. We've saved people's houses from foreclosure. Like we've had big life changing stuff happen. Yeah. And when we get the emails about that and they say, holy shit, I just fell off my chair when I received the money and this is going to change my life or my kid's life. That is my favorite part of the job hands down i freaking love that stuff yeah these are the designers where you're featuring their works on the site (laughs) yeah exactly yeah Yeah. tom thank you this has been fantastic i want to be the first one to thank you everyone should check out designcuts.com check out honest designers podcast and his new honest entrepreneurs podcast tom thank you so much thanks jeremy appreciate it that was really fun yeah thanks for having me on thank you Feel like a hundred grand